So Nick Melvoin, thank you so much for spending some time with me in your busy schedule. Nick is a school board member for LA Unified, which is the second largest school district in the nation after New York City with 700,000 students. The youngest ever, right? The youngest ever elected board member. Yeah, well, my colleague of mine, uh, Kelly Gomez, was it was it was elected at the same time, and she's a few, I think you know a year or so younger than me. So I got to give her that distinction. But uh, you know, proud to be part of this new generation of younger elected leaders. So. Yeah, I think it's necessary and and well deserved. Nick was elected during the most, I want to say, contentious, nationally uh, televised, watched um, school board election in the in the history of the U.S. The most um, national funding and everything else. But huge congratulations to you, Nick. Um, Thank you. <laughs> he's also an attorney and a huge advocate for equity in education. And during this time, I'd love to ask you a few questions. Um, I watched uh, your school superintendent talk about everything that's going on there, and he was so transparent in terms of the funding that's required, how much has already been accounted for, and what it's needed for. And it was really heartwarming, or, or it made me feel great, especially living in New York City, where we don't have that level of transparency, at least not yet. And I'd love to know your thoughts around that. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. And, you know, t transparency and accountability was a core tenet of my campaign. We launched an open data portal. And I just believe that all the access that I have as a decision maker, parents and the public should have, given that we are a public institution. But we thought it was really important, especially during this time, when everyone is in uncharted waters, to be honest about where we're having successes and where we're having some challenges. One, because I think that that's what the public is owed. But two, because you know, this, we want to be as the second largest district in the country. We want to be um, uh, you know, modeling best practices where we have them, but also getting support where we don't. And so we're running the largest food bank in the country, actually larger than New York. And so that's a success that we have. We kind of took our existing food services division. We took our uh, distribution network of schools and we're serving um, not only kids, but their families and doing a great job. Tech is something where we made a huge investment and we're seeing it now pay off, but we also have a lot of kids who don't have access to devices or to te um, connectivity. And we wanted to own that. And I think, you know, while folks initially were nervous that if we said that 15,000 high school kids hadn't connected, that it would um, lead to lawsuits or liability. But my hunch was that actually, if we, you know, if any district said they're reaching 100% of kids right now, they're lying because there's no way to do that, especially when we're a district where 82% of kids are living in poverty. So wanted to lead with a little humility and say, here's where we're having successes. That number of, that 15,000 number is now down to fewer than 3,000 because we've been getting devices and connectivity out. But also here's where we're struggling and if other districts are struggling, hopefully that gives them permission to be honest and also get support where they need it. And because we are honest, we have had support, whether that's through a partnership with Verizon or Apple, um, people, I think, want to help in this crisis. Um, and so we're just being very transparent about our needs. And just to add some background to that, I, and correct me if these numbers are wrong, but uh, your school district act, asked for $400 million uh, and is accounted for 191. And you're being very transparent about saying this, this is the situation right now, but we can't, I think the words of your superintendent were, we can't sacrifice this generation. Yeah, so I think, you know, we are obviously cognizant of our budgetary needs. I was a teacher in the district during the last recession, but we are saying we're going to lead by investing in what our students need and then being honest about that. And so the meals, you know, we're reimbursed for student meals, but when their parents or when adults come and they need food, we're not turning anyone away. We're saying, yes, have a meal, and we're going to figure out how to pay for it later. We quickly um, procured uh, tens of thousands of devices and, and hotspots. We're now, you know, talking to the governor and the city around re that reimbursement because I think in this day and age, access to the internet is not just a luxury, it's really a necessity. But we move quickly to invest. Um, similarly with professional development, you know, we are uh, really building this plane as we're flying it. Our teachers are teaching as they're also learning how to teach in a digital environment. So it's important that we spent money on that teacher training. Um, and we weren't going to wait until we had secured it. We were going to move quickly because kids are in school uh, virtually, you know, as we speak, and it's important to not waste a minute. 
You know, when you have a district where you have over 18,000 homeless kids, where the district is providing three meals a day to most of its kids, we have mental health clinics and wellness centers. Um, there is an existing crisis in this country that schools were filling in a lot of gaps around, and now this is, is compounding it. And so the challenge um, that we're addressing now is that we're just not funded to do that. So, you know, in California, we get about half as much money per child as New York City, and yet we're trying to do so much more. So I hope one thing that does come out of this is an acknowledgement of what school districts do and then an investment in that, because it's a role that we really enjoy being able to meet the family's needs, but we need funding to do that. So if you can talk about what families, if families and students um, at home want to help the community in this community building efforts and anything that the school districts may need, and, and, and knowing that not everybody lives in LA Unified and we don't have the transparency where districts aren't being necessarily clear about what it is they need, what advice would you give for those families? So, you know, one, I think that like social distancing, staying at home and like helping us flatten those curves so that we can figure out summer programs and, and getting kids back in the fall is really crucial. I think an understanding of the, of the huge needs. I mean, right when this all happened, I had some folks calling who said, you know, uh, at our private school, we transitioned to a full day of Zoom. Why isn't the district doing that? And I think the acknowledgement that we have, we had over 100,000 kids who had no way to connect to the internet when this started. Um, just that, that compassion and understanding that it's not just as easy to say teachers are going to go home and start teaching. A lot of our teachers have their own child care issues that they now need to deal through. So that, that generosity of spirit, I think, is helpful. We have set up two funds, um, LA Students Most in Need org and then um, OneFamilyLA.com, where we're trying to raise money for the tech and food needs, but also just groceries and medical supplies for families. And I know there are similar efforts around the country and we're very grateful for folks who are donating time or, or um, money. Uh, and then in our food distribution centers, we have a partnership with the Red Cross where folks are volunteering to help us distribute food. I was just out yesterday morning for a couple hours at one of our high schools. And so we're grateful for, for folks who are comfortable you know, with protective gear, leaving the home and working. Um, you know, and also just, I think, also asking people to just be kind with themselves. Uh, there's no right way to do this. We're all learning. And so my op we've been doing these virtual town halls and did one yesterday about supporting early learners. But I think one of the messages of that was just parents also need to be kind to themselves because they're working, they're working their jobs, they're at home, they're now their kids, you know, teacher in many cases. And so everyone just needs to think of their own mental health and well-being as well. Well, I appreciate that. Is there anything you've learned from this, some, some note of optimism that you can share with us? Well, you know, it's been inspiring to see how the community has come together to support our students and our families. Um, it's, uh, you know, again, the role that the school district can play. Uh, and as people realize, even those who are coming to our schools for the first time to pick up food and realizing what a service it is. You know, I also think that um, the potential, you know, I, I ran for the school board to Kind of disrupt an education system that I think needs to do a lot better for kids. And this is not a disruption that any of us welcome, but if there's a way to look, use this opportunity to, uh, again, rally behind our kids, our families, our schools who are doing so much, I think there's some good that can come from this. And, and you know, also a generation of students who are more conscientious about public health. One of the things I'm looking at is, can we, can, can we create more medical pathways as a result of this to get, to get kids into, um, jobs, some that require college, some that, some that don't, um, and, you know, retool some of our high schools, you know, to produce the next generation of frontline responders. That's fascinating. I mean, I feel like we need to bring more media attention to the education sector. I feel like this has not gotten the front page kind of, I guess, it, it just, it hasn't gotten the attention that it requires when a lot of families are struggling right now. Yeah, and you know, the New York Times actually did just do an article about our food efforts, and I published an op-ed um, when we closed. But I agree. I mean, I think it's um, the work that school districts across the country are doing, and the questions we're going to be thinking about. Even just, you know, we were um, it was a very tough decision for us to close schools because of the wraparound services. But we we made the decision before the city or state had had a safer at home order, and so I'd like to think that we also helped through that kind of fast planning help flatten the curve in LA where things are, you know, you know, God willing, relatively stable still. Um, and so, you know, as districts have done that, I think it, we've tried to be good, model good behavior too, just given how we've got a million, between our adults and teachers in the system and students, about a million people impacted by LA Unified. 
The last thing I'll say too is that we made a commitment right away to um, and retain every employee with their full pay. And we employ about 80,000 people in LA. And so as we saw today, new unemployment numbers and nearly 30 million Americans, even though our core mission is educating kids, we also thought um, well, we're gonna make this commitment to keep everyone employed so that we can you know, uh, do something to stabilize the economy in LA as well. And I know other school districts are doing that too. That's phenomenal. I hope everybody hears this and legislators hear this so that it, it, your phenomenal model and a role model too. Thank you so much, Nick. Thanks so much for having me. Stay safe, healthy, sane, positive. You too. Thank you.